stream events at the museum. So please do bear with us if there's any technical issues or if we don't make it through all of your questions today. My name is Geraldine. And I'm Emma. And we both work in the education department at the National Museum of Ireland Natural History, also known as the Dead Zoo. Tonight, we are going to show you some of the rarest and most special specimens in the collections of the museum. We are very excited to show these to you. And we're also giving you, our viewers, the chance to ask us your questions live. So be sure to post them in the comments and we will do our best to answer as many as possible during the session. Have you been to this museum before? Let us welcome you inside now with a short video introduction. Welcome to the National Museum of Ireland Natural History, sometimes called the Dead Zoo. My name is Geraldine. And I'm Emma. We are both zoologists and museum educators. Today, we're going to take you inside the museum to see some of the animals and learn more about them. Let's go. This science museum opened its doors over 163 years ago. And today, it has over 10,000 animals and fossils for you to see up close discover the wildlife of the Irish room and fossils of animals that used to live in Ireland long ago. Visit the Mammals of the World exhibition where you can get nose to nose with some of the largest creatures on earth from whale skeletons to elephants and even a tiger. And don't forget to look at the balconies where you'll find lots of fish, reptiles, birds, insects, spiders and much more. You can visit the museum to see all these exciting animals or visit the website to see more videos and a 3D virtual walkthrough of the museum on which you can learn more about the exhibits from the comfort of your own home or classroom. See if you're able to spot your favorite animal. Could it be the rare giant panda? Or maybe a basking shark, the biggest fish in the Irish Sea. Step inside one of Ireland's most visited museums where there are lots of amazing things to learn and explore. Hopefully that gave everyone a good idea of what you can expect when you visit the museum in person or online. At the moment, there are some big renovations happening at the museum. So some parts of the building are closed, and this means some of our exhibits are not on view at the moment. But if you can't wait to explore the museum and get inside, why not try our 3D virtual visit that you saw in the video? It's a really great online resource that can be used from the comfort of your very own home, and you can, you can explore all the animals in the museum, including the ones mentioned in the video, and including those um, upper, le upper levels of the museum that you might remember have been enclosed to the public since 2007. We have 10,000 zoological and geological specimens and animals for you to see. So there's lots to see, so make sure to take a peek online. Just go to museum.ie, select natural history that's in blue, and then to find the virtual visit, it's in the visitor information on the website. Now, onto the very special lineup of animals. Tonight, we want to highlight some rare and important specimens in our collections, and in our opinion, some of the coolest. These animals are ones we like to use to talk about the topic of extinction. Take a look at this short video to learn more. And remember, if you have any questions you'd like to ask, just put them in the comments. These animals are all very different, but they all have one thing in common. Can you think of a word people use to describe when a species or type of animal is no longer found living somewhere? That's right, it's extinct. To be extinct means to no longer exist, like the dinosaurs. But there are many more examples of animals that have become extinct over the history of life on Earth and there are many different reasons why an animal might go extinct. Can you think of any? Some examples are through overhunting, climate change, natural disasters, 
habitat loss or losing the places where they live, or pollution. These things can be natural, like how the dinosaurs became extinct, or they can be caused by humans. Hopefully that video gave you a good idea of what it means when we say an animal is extinct. Now, I think it's time we take some questions. So, mm -hmm. Emma, we have a question from Matthew, who's age nine. Mm -hmm. Matthew asks, how do people know what kind of animals lived in the past and what they looked like? Oh, that's an excellent question, Matthew. People know what animals lived in the past because some people have found evidence of these animals in the ground. Fossils are the remains or traces of plants and animals that have been preserved in rock or mineral form over thousands of years. The word fossil itself means having been dug up. A fossil can preserve an entire animal or just part of one. Bones, shells and feathers can all become fossils. Paleontologists are the people who study fossils and studying them helps us learn about when and how animals lived over millions of years on Earth. Sometimes fossils can even tell us how much the Earth has changed over time. So I think that brings us really well onto our first animal of the evening, Great. Geraldine. And one every visitor to the museum gets to meet when they come inside the door. Take a closer look in this video. One of the most amazing things you can see at the museum are these giant skeletons. Have you seen a similar shaped animal anywhere in Ireland before? You may have seen deer, such as the red deer in Killarney National Park in County Kerry, or the fallow deer in the Phoenix Park in Dublin. These are the fossil skeletons of another type of deer that also used to live right here in Ireland, the giant Irish deer. These amazing animals roamed the grasslands of Ireland over 10,000 years ago. Unfortunately, we can't see them today because they are extinct. So, how do we know that they lived here in the past? We know this because their fossil skeletons were found under the bogs in Ireland. Scientists think that these giant Irish deer went extinct even before humans arrived in Ireland and some think that they went extinct as a result of natural climate change. There was a long period of cold in Ireland, about 10,000 years ago, which lasted for 500 years. During this time, Ireland was covered in a blanket of ice and snow. Plants disappeared and the deer could no longer find food to survive, so they eventually went extinct. Did you see the size of the antlers on the giant Irish deer's head? They hold the record for the largest antlers of any deer species in the world, living or extinct. But what are antlers? Basically, they're bony structures that sprout from the forehead of a deer, deer skull. And usually only males have them, but there are exceptions, for example, reindeer. So we have some real antlers you might have noticed on the table here today from our handling collection. And the first one I want to show you is from a fallow deer. And you, see, you can see a picture of the fallow deer from the museum uh, on your screens now. Mm -hmm. And so if we look at the antler here, if you look at the top part, you can see it's nice and flat or palmate. So it basically looks like the palm of your hand and your fingers scrunch, scrunched up. And so fallow deer and also giant Irish deer have this palmate shape in their antlers. Mm -hmm. And that's because the fallow deer is the giant Irish deer's closest living relative. Now we have another antler to show you here that Emma has, and this is a totally different shape. And that's because it belongs to a different species. And you can see it on the screens now, it's the red deer. The red deer is actually the largest deer species in Ireland living today. And as you can see on the crown of the antler, it's, it's not flat. It has um, points or tines. And this one has about six points on it. And red deer antlers can have up to eight points on each antler. So they can get much bigger than this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my favourite fact about antlers is 
that every single year, the males would shed or cast their antlers and regrow a brand new pair within a few months. Even the giant Irish deer with their massive antlers that are bigger than myself and Emma combined in length would shed or cast their antlers every year and regrow a brand new pair just in time for the breeding season when they would fight with other males. That's amazing, Geraldine. <laughs> and I think it's time for another question. We have one in here from Great. Jenny, who wants to know, how many giant Irish deer do we have in the museum? Mm, very good question. And the short answer to that is lots, Jenny. <laughs> we have loads. And actually, in fact, I think we have the largest collection um, of John Irish deer in any museum in the world. So we're really lucky. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so if you would, if you were to visit the museum or check uh, the virtual visit online, and if you were to go to the Irish room on the ground floor, you would see we have three uh, complete fossil skeletons of John Irish deer, one female and two males. They're on display in the museum. Then we also have skulls and antlers hanging from the walls in the Irish room. Uh, so that's what you can see if you visit the museum. But we also have a scientific collection. Mm -hmm. And the scientific collection is stored off-site. And that collection is what scientists use when they want to study um, animals like the giant Irish deer. Mm -hmm. And in the scientific collection, we have loads. We have about the remains from about 250 individual giant Irish deer. Mm -hmm. And we also, I think, have about another seven complete fossil skeletons. Wow. So lots. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Right, I think it's uh, time for our next video. Okay. It's about a bird, and it's probably the most well-known story of extinction caused by humans. Extinction is not just something that happened in the ancient past. Some animals have gone extinct in much more recent times this is one of the rarest specimens in our museum collections. It is a skeleton of a dodo bird. The dodo was one of the first animals known to go extinct due to human actions in modern history. The dodo was a large bird which lived on an island called Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. After spending many generations living on the island with no predators, dodos became flightless and developed a ground living ground nesting lifestyle with no need to fly to escape predators. All was well until the 1600s when humans began visiting the island as a stop on their round the world sailing explorations. Ships carried rats to the island and they began to eat the dodo's eggs. These flightless birds were easy to hunt and provided a good source of fresh food for sailors after months at sea. With no way of escaping these new predators, the dodo eventually became hunted to extinction in 1688. Very few specimens exist in museums around the world. We only know what they looked like from early drawings and paintings that were made in the 1600s, most of which are now thought to be inaccurate. Only one taxidermy or stuffed specimen of the dodo exists today at the Oxford University Museum of Natural History, and only the head and one foot still survive. The dodo remains one of the most famous examples of extinction caused by humans. We hope you enjoyed that video about the dodo. It really is one of the most famous examples of extinction. The extinction of the dodo even gave rise to that famous phrase, as dead as a dodo. One thing I find so interesting about them is that the paintings we have of the dodo might be inaccurate. This makes sense because these paintings are mostly based on descriptions and probably weren't paintings of live dodos. Specimens like the dodo are so important because they show people how final extinction is and why conservation is so important. Protecting endangered species is important because everyone is part of the tree of life or biodiversity, and they all do the very important job of keeping nature in balance. Even removing just one species can have knock-on effects on many other plants and animals that share its environment. 
So now we have one last animal to show you this evening. And this video looks at an animal that went extinct in more recent times. This animal, the very unusual thylacine, is one that went extinct in recent times. Other names include the Tasmanian tiger or Tasmanian wolf. If you take a closer look, you can see why. It looks like a dog or wolf-shaped animal with stripes along its back, like a tiger. They lived in Australia and on an island called Tasmania, although it looks like a dog. This animal was actually a closer relative of animals such as the kangaroo and the koala. It was a marsupial, meaning it had a pouch to carry its young. When Europeans traveled to Australia and Tasmania in the 1800s, they brought animals such as sheep to farm. But thylacines were thought to be sheep hunters and soon rewards were offered by the government to anyone who would hunt and kill a thylacine. As a result, many thylacines were hunted and by 1914, they were considered a rare species. People began to realize that perhaps some of these animals should be protected or kept in zoos. However, humans knew very little about how to keep them and they were declared extinct in 1936 when the last known thylacine died in Hobart Zoo in Tasmania. Only under 800 specimens are found in museums around the world today, and we are lucky enough to have some here. We use the thylacine as an important reminder of the impact that humans can have on nature and what can happen when we don't work hard to protect a species. That's the last video of this evening, and we hope you enjoyed them as much as we did making them. The thylacine you just saw there is an unusual animal, mm -hmm. but a common extinction story when it comes to predators. As you heard in the video, uh, there are just under 800 thylacines around the, uh, uh, in museum collections around the world today. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you would like to see the ones in the museum in the dead zoo, please go on the virtual visit and head to the first floor find the marsupial cabinet, which has a big kangaroo in it. <laughs> and there you can see the thylacines on display. And we do have a stuffed or taxidermy thylacine, a skeleton of a thylacine, and we have a few skulls as well. So you might have noticed we have a skull on our table as well. Mm -hmm. And this is a replica or fake thylacine skull. And we use these in our handling collection. Um, or these are from our handling collection, and we use these during our tours and workshops. Mm -hmm. um, as you can see, it's on a very large skull. Uh, and as Emma said in the video, they look very similar to dogs or wolves. And you might ask the question, how do you know it's not a dog or a wolf? And that would be a good question, but I'm gonna show you how we can identify a thylacine skull. So I'm gonna bring it up closer to the screen here so you can have a good look. So hopefully you can see that now. I'm just gonna remove the lower jaw and flip the skull over. And I'm gonna show you that these, these two holes here in the mm -hmm. roof of the mouth of the thylacine. And only marsupials have these holes here uh, in the roof of their mouth. Mm. So mammals like wolves or uh, dogs do not have these holes. So that's one way you can identify them. Now I'm going to close it back over and have a look at the teeth. Thylacines have lots of teeth. They have 46 in total. Wolves only have 42. So that's another way you can identify them. And if you have a nice close look at the teeth here when I open the jaws, you can see it's big canine teeth and not lots of nice back molars there that are nice and jagged and sharp so it is typical um, of a carnivore or meat eater so oh. pretty cool skull <laughs> yeah thanks for that demo no Geraldine um, it's great to see um, how you can tell the difference yeah and we do have a question about thylacines oh. that's come in from Jamie and Jamie asks is it true that there have been recent sightings of the thylacine Good question, okay, yeah. So some people do believe that there are thylacines still in the wild today. Mm -hmm. um, and like over the years, there's been many reports of sightings of thylacines. Mm -hmm. uh, so there were so many reports that they actually organized several searches to see, okay, are there any left? And one of the last ones was in 2012, I believe. Mm -hmm. And still, there's just no evidence to suggest that there are thylacines in the wild. 
Mm. Yeah, unfortunately. I haven't found yeah. any. Okay. Uh, we have another question here, and uh, it's from Amy. And okay. Amy wants to, uh, is, she's asking, what do you think the role of Natural History Museums is in the current age of extinction? Oh, okay. So that's an excellent question, Amy. And it's something that's so relevant in today's world. Something that's important to remember is how important natural history collections are for scientific research and learning. To protect nature, you have to describe it and you have to understand it. And that's always been the role of natural history collections around the world. There are places where we can go and we wonder and we marvel at the animal kingdom that we're part of. And even now, new and previously unknown species are being found hidden in natural history collections and described to science for the first time. Museum specimens can also tell us a lot about the environment that that animal has lived in. And sometimes this can be used as evidence for environmental damage. So for example, um, one of the most famous examples is um, museum collections were used to identify damage caused to bird eggs by a pesticide called DDT, which was widely used in the past. And this kind of information helps us understand and protect the natural world, and also helps us prevent future extinctions. Great. Okay, so we have run out of time, I think, but there's just one question there. Um, okay, yeah, so our, there's a question here that's come in, and it's a, it, the question is, are molars, so the, those back teeth we saw on the thylacine, are they also called carnassal teeth? from Peter? That is a good question. Mm -hmm. And yes, uh, sometimes they are called carnassal teeth in carnivores. I think more so though, like the big cats, mm -hmm. they're known as carnassal teeth. Um, so yeah, good, very good question. Um, but we really have run out of time now, guys, so we're sorry about that. Uh, sorry we couldn't answer all the other questions. Mm -hmm. Though, um, we do have a question for you guys to think about after the event mm -hmm. uh, is over. Uh, so the question is, if you could travel back in time to visit one extinct animal, what would it be? Ooh. My pick is the fantastic Megalodon, the giant shark. I'd love to see one mm. of them. What about oh, you, Emma? I don't know. Um, there's so many to choose from, but I think one I'd love to see is um, a type of extremely large extinct bird from South America called mm. Argentavis. Um, it's very big and I'd, I'd just love to see it alive. Cool. Um, so, um, Thank you everyone for watching this event and for all the great questions. Um, please do check out the website and give the 3D virtual visit a go. Um, or do head to our engage and learn pages for loads more videos and activities inspired by the collections that help you explore the natural world. And of course, please like, subscribe and follow our social media pages too. Great. Goodbye, Great. guys. Thanks Bye. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Don't forget to check out Siobhan's chat with Matt about the new Galenda Lock exhibition at NMI Archaeology. That's starting at 6.30 tonight. Very good. Goodbye. Have a good culture <laughs> night. Thank you. See ya.